Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and uh, last time we finished up, I think, around verse 11, as we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, I had hoped to get through completely with verse 11, because it ends with, Amen. And Amen was a good place to stop, and then we'd start today in verse 12, but I kind of need to back up, because I didn't quite finish up last time, but I'm hoping today, because we only have to go to uh, verse 19, that we'll finish up 1 Peter chapter 4. But we looked last time at certain key words. Charity, what did he say there in verse 8? Well, both Peter and Paul say that above all things, the most important thing is charity. What is charity? Well, it's like kindness. It's being kind to other people. Um, hospitality, verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. So we're supposed to have hospitality. And then in verse um, 10, it talks about ministering. What does it mean to minister? It means to help other people. So this is all what the Bible is teaching. And there's a theme, it appears. And that theme is to be nice to people. Don't be mean. Don't be hateful. Don't be angry. Don't be dirty to other people. Be nice to folks and be right and good and caring about other people. And that's the way we're supposed to be. Now, let's uh, start today then in verse 10. I want to start in verse 12, but I wanted to finish up verse 10 and 11 from last time. So verse 10, as every man hath received the gift. All right, so God has a gift for all of us. What is that gift? Do you have any gifts? Now, one of these days I'll talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, we'll get to that one day if I get a chance. But salvation is a free gift. And gift is giving. God gave us eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. So we get eternal life in the free, free gift through Christ. And I thank God for that free gift of salvation. I'm just so thankful for salvation. It's so good to be saved. And it's the free gift that God offers. Thank God for that free gift of eternal life. Well then, after I'm saved, then what should I do? I should give. I should give Christ my life, give Him my love, give Him my all. Uh, like it says in verse 1, I should do everything I could and can to cease from sin. I shouldn't, verse 2, live in the lust of the flesh. I shouldn't walk a certain way, in verse 3, in different sins, but I should walk in righteousness and doing right. Because someday I'll be judged, as will everyone. Um, I'm saved, though. I'm going to the judgment seat of Christ. The lost are going to the great white throne of judgment, and there is a difference. So, he's talking there, and he's telling me to be sober in verse 7. And so that's another thing to do. So, I'm just, as you go through the Bible, you know what's fun? Just to take key words, and look at these key words in the Bible, and go look them up in, the, in other passages, and that's always fun to do. So, verse uh, 11 says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to minister to others. And minister basically means to be a servant or to help other Christians. And Christians should always be able to count on other Christians. Unfortunately, I alluded to a little bit last time, we have some people that claim to be Christians that are just evil, that are just mean, that are just hateful. Uh, they hold a grudge, verse 9, and they talk bad about others. And yeah, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. So how, and they don't have any grace. I forgot to write up here grace. They have no grace whatsoever. And if God had grace with us, we should have grace with others. So how should we speak? Well, verse um, 11 says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now, what are the oracles of God? The oracles of God are the 66 books of the King James Bible. So the oracles, that's the Bible. The oracles of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what's it all for? To glorify Jesus, to glorify God, to praise Him. If we're putting down the flesh and doing right, then He gets all the praise. He gets all the 
glory. And if you are what you're supposed to be as a Christian, then God gets the glory from you because you're being these things. And you don't go around bragging on yourself and how great you are and you're God's gift to mankind because you're so wonderful. <laughs> no, it's not about how great you are. It's I'm doing these things because I want God to get the glory. So there is a way that we're supposed to speak. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Verse 11, if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. This would be ministering by preaching and teaching the word of God, the oracles of God. How are we supposed to speak? Well, let's go to Ephesians 4.15 and see what old Paul says. Because there are some people out there that think that as a preacher, they have to speak a certain way. And they think that the way they're supposed to preach and teach is hatefully and meanly and critically and be angry and hateful and scream and holler and name call and mock and, and put down other people. Is that the way? That we're to, I mean, does that even minister? Does that edify? I forgot the word edify over here. Uh, we looked at that last time. We're supposed to edify others. Does that edify? Putting others down and name calling and, and mocking and making fun of them? No, no. In Ephesians chapter um, 4 and verse 15, look what it says. But speaking the truth in love. <laughs> well, there's how we're supposed to speak. We're supposed to speak the truth in love. Not of guile, not of meanness, not of hatred, not of malice. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So there is a way that we who are saved should speak, and it should be with love. We should practice kindness, meekness, grace, hospitality, charity. We should care about being nice to others and edifying them, and that is how we minister to other people. If anyone calls themselves a minister, and yet they're hateful, mean-spirited, angry, all they do is call names and put others down and attack them, you can mark it down. Either they're lost, and I don't know, they might be saved, or if they are saved, they are carnal, and they're in the flesh, and they are not glorifying God. They're only glorifying themselves. And many of them exalt their opinions higher than the Word of God. I find that sad. Let's go to, uh, well, let's go back to Ephesians 4. I forgot to read the context. Ephesians, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So we ought to grow up. We shouldn't be kids, right? I showed you one time, I've got it here, I won't lift well. I got it here, I showed you one time that I prove I'm not a kid anymore because I graduated from kindergarten. I got my diploma. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice today. Try to keep it enough to finish up. But it says we're supposed to grow up. We're not supposed to act like children. And he says that in verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. What does verse 16 say? From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. So we that are Christians, the way to minister is to show that we love other Christians and edify them by telling them what the Bible says. Not our opinion, but what the scripture says. Now go to Colossians 4 and verse 6. We're talking about right now how we're supposed to speak, according to the Bible. There's a certain way that we as Christians, how we should speak. And the way we're supposed to speak is not evil. We're supposed to speak in a certain way in which we're showing forth that we really do truly love other Christians, and we're speaking in love in order to edify other Christians. Colossians 4.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What is the word of Christ? The Bible. So we're supposed to memorize it and have it in our head, but we're also supposed to have it in our heart and practice what the Bible says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So teaching and admonishing each other with love and with grace in our hearts. 
Okay? So now let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 4. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So this is how we should speak. I just showed you some other verses. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. That God in all things may be what? Glorified. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you want to glorify Him? Do you want to give Him all the praise and all the honor? Let Him get the, the honor? Well, if so... I like the old spelling, honor. If, if so, then you better have this stuff. You better have grace and charity and be kind to other Christians. You better have hospitality. You better be nice. Try to edify and love and speak right. No evil speaking. We've already looked at 1 Peter where several times he talks about not to have evil speaking. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings. As newborn babes desire to submit to the milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Grow up if you're a Christian. Don't remain a babe in Christ. This is how you grow up. It's putting up with other people. It's having long suffering with others. Now, I have people on YouTube that attack me all the time. And I could stoop to their level and make videos against them every time they make videos against me. But I would be wasting my time because then it would just be me and them fighting one another. How does that glorify God? It doesn't. So if I ignore them, if I just say, Lord, help them, get them right, pray for them, and I devote my time to being the kind of minister that the Bible says, studying the Word, learning the Word, and then ministering the Word, teaching you what the Bible says, and that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to teach the Word of God. And I teach it in love, and I come across as what I want to be, loving and caring. I really do care. I really do love you in the Lord if you're saved. And I really do want to help you by teaching you how you should be as a Christian. I'm doing my best. Not perfect, but I try. If I do that, then according to verse 11, God gets the praise and the honor and the glory. And that's what I want. I want God to be pleased with me. Is God pleased with you? When God looks down from heaven, does he go, that's my son, look how great he's doing. <laughs> or does he go, oh, that's my son. Oh, <laughs> I don't know much about this, because um, I have a son, but he's only almost three years old. But I look back in my life and I think about the times when dad looked at me. And there were some things I did in my life that were dumb and stupid, and I wish I hadn't done it. And and I remember Dad having to say, that's my son, and he was kind of ashamed of it. And then I remember times when, like when I went to Honduras, and I was preaching as a missionary, and I was gone in the foreign field, and I'd come back, and I'd preach in a church or something, and Dad would say, that's my son, you know. See the difference? When I'm doing bad, it's like, oh, that's my son. <laughs> but when you're doing right, hey, that's my son over there. You know, you're happy with him. Well, I want God to be happy with me, to be pleased with my life. I want him to be up in heaven going, hey, Michael, hey, Gabriel, look down there at Robert Breaker. Now, that's my son. <laughs> look what he's doing. Because when we're saved, we're sons of God. But in order to glorify God, it's not by me being angry, mean, hateful, full of malice and envy. Not by my making videos on YouTube attacking other Christians and putting them down and calling them names. It's not me in the flesh just lashing out to people that glorifies God. No, no, no. A thousand times no. What glorifies God is when I do these things. I hope, I have over a thousand videos on YouTube, I hope that when you think of Robert Breaker, you think of a guy that does this. <laughs> because that's who I'm trying to be, that's who I'm trying to tell you to be. Because that's what the Bible says to be. So if you speak as the oracles of God, verse 11, and you administer it with the ability which God give you, gave you, then God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Are you glorifying God in the way you live and the way you speak? To whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So God be praised, and may he get all the praise and honor and glory. Amen. So I wanted to stop last time there in verse 11. But um, let me go ahead and, and, and say one more thing, give you a couple more verses, then we'll start in verse 12. But uh, that's what it's all about, folks. Make sure you're saved, because when you get saved, you get the free gift of eternal life, and you don't go to hell. 
Then after you're saved, do everything you can to get away from sin and to please God by the way you live. Because I want God to be happy with me. Do you? Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. How is God glorified by us? How does God get the glory from a sinner? <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, you're probably thinking, what? How, how can I glorify God when I'm just still in this sinful flesh? Well, the way He is trying to obey the Scripture. And we have our moments as sinful human beings. Sometimes we do right. And God in heaven goes, that's right. That makes me happy. Sometimes we do wrong. And it's awful. But in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, look at what Paul says. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of his calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Let him get the glory. And ye in him, according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. When I'm saved, I have Jesus in me through the Holy Spirit. I want that to work out of me. Well, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, meekness, kindness, you know, all these things. And I want to be the type of Christian that God said I'm supposed to be. And when I do that, when I walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, and I do these things, then God gets the glory. And Jesus Christ can be glorified through me. Let's go to Philippians. So are you doing that? What kind of Christian are you? The kind that God said to be? Or are you a sorry excuse for a Christian, much less a human being? I hate to talk like that, but more and more and more, I'm seeing worse and worse and worse people that claim to be Christians. And I don't like it. I don't like listening to someone who says, I'm a Christian, and then they're cussing, and they're, they're lying about other people, and they're slandering, and they're making up stories about others, and spreading it all over the world, and things like that. And it just, that bothers me. I want people to know the truth. And I want to preach the truth, and I don't want to devote my time to attacking others. It's not about me making myself look better than that guy. And it's not about me trying to say, well, I have to correct him because he's wrong. No, I have some grace on that person. I'm praying for him. It's about me saying, well, what can I do, Lord, to please you? How can you get honor and glory through me? Are you there yet? Is that where you are in your Christian life? Are you trying to give God glory through your life? Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God that worketh in you both to, to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. <laughs> Ever since I've been saved, I've seen Christians that murmur and complain and dispute. A dispute is an, an argument. And one of the things that I hate the most is to see Christians arguing about something. And you can't start an argument unless you throw all these things out the window. It's very hard to have an argument with someone if you have charity and love them. If you're charitable and care about someone and they don't agree, then you can sit down and say, well, tell me what you think. And they tell you what, what they think, and you say, you know, well, let me show you these verses, let me show you what I think. And then if you don't agree, then you can say, you know what, I still love you in the Lord, but I just don't agree. But unfortunately, there's some Christians that can't do that. When they come to a place where they can't agree, then one of them gets angry, gets mad, gets bitter, gets full of malice and bitterness and hatred, and cannot... Let it go. No charity. And so they devote their time to attacking that other Christian and disputing and, and speaking evil against them. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that you may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored, in vain. So God can work in you. It is His pleasure to work in you. But if you're one of those Christians that's in the flesh speaking evil of other people and saying horrible things and you're not practicing charity or kindness or um, any kind of hospitality and you're not ministering to people, then God's not going to work through you. The devil's going to be working through you, unfortunately. And He'll get the glory, not Jesus. 
So it's the Bible, holding forth the word of truth of the Bible. That's what I want to do, hold forth the word of God and show you what it says. Let's go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. You might say, well, how do I... How do I become the type of Christian that I'm supposed to be? How do I how do I do these things? Well, you have to know what these things are and where to find them. If you read your Bible, you'll see that this is what a true Christian is supposed to be like. And then you'll want to practice that. I like this verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Paul is speaking and he says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, now watch this, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. If I'm saved, and I am, and I have Jesus in me, and I'm reading his word, the word of God gets inside of me, and the word works in me. And then Jesus can use that to show me to act like this, and then I can act that way, and when I act the way that God says, then God is pleased and God gets the glory. I, I don't want to attempt to say that I completely understand this. I don't. But being a father helps. <laughs> I prayed for many years, Lord, I want a son. I want a little blonde-headed, blue-eyed boy like I was when I was a kid. Now I'm a green, green-eyed, uh, darker hair, color boy. <laughs> but anyway, um, and God finally gave me the son that I've always prayed for. And I have a son, and he delights me. He excites me. He makes me happy. And I just so enjoy him when he's doing right. <laughs> but when he's doing wrong, oh my goodness, it's so vexing. It hurts so much that he does something he's not supposed to do. Um, and it hurts. And my relationship with my son is helping me to understand my relationship with my Father in heaven. And it's just so amazing to me. It's something, I guess, if you're a woman, you can never understand. <laughs> but if you're a man, you can. So, all praise and all dominion to Jesus Christ. And let me go back to uh, First um, Peter and let me show you that. It says, In God... Oh, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So all praise be to God. All right? He should have all the praise and all dominion. What is the dominion of Christ? Well, we know the Bible. We know that here's the rapture. Here's the tribulation. But after the tribulation, Jesus comes back in Armageddon and in the millennial kingdom why he rules on earth. So here's his dominion physically. He's physically reigning for a thousand years. But you know, Jesus has a spiritual dominion, and that's inside of the heart of the believer now. And so the question is, are you going to let Jesus in you reign? Christ or Jesus in you? Does he have dominion? Are you serving Him? Are you bowing to His will? Are you walking in the Spirit that you fulfill not the lust of the flesh? If so, then He's got dominion now. Alright, now verse 12. Think, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Alright, so we're getting closer to trying to find out when was the book of Peter written. And it appears to be written during a time when Christianity as a whole went through a great fiery trial. Now, when could that have been? Huh. A strange, fiery trial. Well, if you know your history, you know that in the early church there was a king in Rome named Nero. And uh, one of the first persecutions of Christians was around 62 to 63 A.D. And that trial, that persecution of Christians, was awful. And Nero persecuted Christians. And it wasn't a really big persecution at first. There were just some Christians being persecuted. But it was in 64 A.D., in which Rome burned. 
And if you believe history, Nero burned it down himself. And when Nero burned Rome, he blamed Christians. And he said, Christians are to blame. They're the ones that set it on fire. And the old you know, saying is, and who knows if this was true, but he played his fiddle while Rome burned. <laughs> Nero went out and saw all the city, and he got out his little violin and was going, la da 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 He was crazy, they say. One of the craziest people that ever lived. And he wanted an excuse to kill Christians. Well, let's go back to 1 Peter 1.7. 1 Peter 1.7, The trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Why, why is he mentioning fire and a trial? <laughs> He's using the term trial. Well, when you think of a trial, you think of going to court for something. In a fire? Why is he saying fire? Well, you go back to chapter 4 and verse um, 12. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Fiery trial. Well, the only fire that I know of around 60 AD that led to the persecution of Christians was in 64 AD when Rome burned. And when Rome burned, Nero said, I'm not going to take the blame, even though he's the one that set it on fire. He said, let's blame all the Christians and start killing them. And so you had a great persecution of Christians after 64 AD. And they were brought for trial before Rome, and they were cast into the Colosseum. They were burned at the stake. They were fed to the lions and things like that. So could that be? Could that help date the book of 1 Peter? Could it have been written around 64 to 66 A.D.? I don't know. In my Bible, again, the Bible note says 60 A.D. Okay, I don't know how you know that. Uh, 2 Peter says 66 A.D., which is, which is six years later. I, you can't go by the dates in the Bible because those are in the reference, and so those are notes. And someone is trying to say, well, we think around 60 A.D. the book was... But it makes more sense. He's mentioning fire. And anybody in that time would have thought, oh, yeah, remember when Rome burned down? And, and what was it? I don't remember how much of Rome, but it was a lot of the city of Rome that burned down. Now, thinking about that, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. And in Ephesians 6, 16, we read this. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So this is the passage of Scripture about putting on the whole armor of God. And having a shield for the fiery darts of the wicked. So fiery trial coming from the wicked. Nero was wicked. He was a lost man. He was evil. And he hated Christians, so he used that as an excuse to persecute Christians. And he burned down Rome, and then he said, the Christians did it. Now let's go persecute them. And they did. So could this be historical context of when the book of First Peter was actually written? Could it be that scholars were wrong? No. They're never wrong, are they? <laughs> Many times in our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, I've showed you how often scholars are wrong. If they just simply read and believe the Bible, they wouldn't get it wrong, would they? And a lot of times when you read it, you kind of connect the dots and go, well, that makes sense that he would have been writing to Christians in Rome um, after this burned down, and they got all the blame for it. And he's like, hey, you know, don't worry about it. They're going to kill you. They're going to persecute you. But just, hey, put God first. Don't worry about it. Because you're what? The theme of 1 Peter is suffering. And boy, the Christians in Rome were suffering under the persecution. Many of them had to go and live in what were called the catacombs. i got a book somewhere. I might have given it away. I've got so many books I can't even keep track of all of them. And uh, it was about the catacombs and how Christians had to live underground in those times for fear of persecution. So he's talking about your trial and the trials that you have to go through. There's another word for trial, and it's tribulation. And all throughout the Bible, we read of Christians going through certain trials or tribulations. Let's look at some verses on that. Acts 14, 22. Acts chapter 14 and verse 22. And in Acts chapter 14, 22, it says, Confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now that's not that, the tribulation period. No, that's Christians having to go through trials, having to go through uh, persecutions. They're going through suffering. 
So the word tribulation oftentimes in the Bible isn't talking about that period. It's talking about Christians going through trials in their lives or tribulations or suffering. Let's go to Romans 5. Paul uses the term often. Romans chapter 5 and verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is spread abroad in, uh, abroad in the hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So here's glorying in your tribulations. Well, that sounds just like Peter and what Peter said. What did Peter say? Peter said, if you suffer... Be happy. Rejoice. Suffering for righteousness sake. And things like that. We'll see more of that in chapter 5 and here in chapter 4 when we get back to it. Um, 8.35. Romans 8.35. Look what he says here. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? No. Verse 37. Nay. We are more than conqueror. So he's not saying we that are Christians are going through the tribulation. I don't believe that Christians are going in the tribulation, the seven-year period. I believe we get out of the rapture before. But we can go through tribulations, plural, which are problems, trials, um, sufferings that we have to pass through in our lives. Right, Romans 12, 12. Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Uh, there's so many verses here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 4. And 2 Corinthians 7, 4. I won't read them all, okay? I'm just going to give them to you. You can write them down. Ephesians 3.13. Make sure you write these down. Ephesians 3.13. 1 Thessalonians 3.4. 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 and 6. And then Revelation 1, 9. These are all places and passages where it talks about tribulations that a Christian can go through. And that's what the trials of our life or our suffering is called. Now, let's go back to 1 Peter. Chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing might happen unto you. Now it's funny, if this was written in 60 AD, then Peter's prophesying as he's writing to Christians, he's going, now watch out for this fiery trial that's going to come to you in the future. <laughs> that happened in 64 AD when we're unburned, and because of that, it was blamed on the Christians, and then Christians were persecuted. <laughs> was... Peter being a prophet as he was writing this, was it really written in 60 AD before this happened? How would he have known that this was going to take place? Either way you look at it, you can't help but see God wrote this book. Because when a man wrote the book in the Bible, it was the Holy Spirit writing through him. Now, let's go to um, verse 13. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, look at the word that old Peter just spit out. Old Peter said, hey now, when you suffer, he said, rejoice. Now, if you've gone through our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, through the epistles of Paul, this is probably one of the favorite words of Paul the Apostle. So without a doubt... You clearly see Peter, and you clearly see Paul. And yes, the book of Acts, there's a transition. But these two, they got together. And now Peter is using a Paul word. <laughs> How many times have we gone through Peter so far, and we're seeing Peter and Paul saying the same things over and over? It shows me they got on the same page, and they started to preach the same thing. So rejoice. Paul taught rejoice as well. Let's go to Romans 5. Let me show you some places where Paul said to rejoice. Now, it's hard to rejoice in suffering, isn't it? Is it easy to be happy when things aren't going your way? No, not always. But we're supposed to rejoice. Romans 5, 2 says, But whom also we have access by faith unto this grace, wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations. I think I read this verse earlier. Um, Romans 12, 15. Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Um, Philippians 2. So Paul is over and 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 over telling Christians, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Matter of fact, in the second, we're going to look at the verse where he says, Rejoice! And again, I say rejoice. <laughs> One time wasn't enough. He had to say it twice. And yet we see Peter saying the same thing. Philippians 2, verse 17 and 18. 
Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Paul is saying, look, if I have to go through something, if I have to make a sacrifice, if something bad has to happen to me, I'll rejoice with you because it's for the cause of Christ and it will help to minister to you as well. Verse 18, for the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. Chapter 3, verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Um, let's go to 4.4. 4. Can you see this? Over and over, rejoice. Here it is, Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. <laughs> Colossians 1.24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Peter is talking all about the suffering that he had to go through. And Paul is saying, yeah, I rejoice in this. Matter of fact, the note in my Bible is Colossians is written about 64 AD. And we know Paul is, is being persecuted too during that time and everything else. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16. Rejoice evermore. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. There's afflictions. There's tribulations. Uh, we'll put here tribulations, afflictions, sufferings. Suffer. Huh, be nice if I spelled it right. Sufferings. And what does he call it? Trials. And in all these times of bad in your life as a Christian, Paul is saying the same thing as Peter. Now you make sure you rejoice. You make sure you have... Now the word rejoice, there's the word joy in it. The, the I is really a Y, so rejoice. Have joy. Be happy, even though you're going through bad times. Why? Because as a Christian, what's the worst they can do? Can't send me to hell. I'm saved. So bring it on. The worst you can do to me is just help me to get closer to Christ and to send me to heaven. So you want to kill me? <laughs> help yourself. What are you you're doing me a favor? You're sending me to heaven. So no matter what happens bad in this world, if we're saved, we can rejoice. I see a lot of Christians, though, sadly, that don't rejoice. They have no joy. Well, we're supposed to have joy. Go to 2 Timothy 1.4. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. There's some joy involved in Christianity. Matter of fact, let's go over to Romans um, 5.11. Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. What is the joy? The joy is the suffering of Christ because we're saved by his blood atonement. And so when I come to Christ and I trust Him, all my sins are washed away, and then I have joy because I know I'm forgiven through His blood. So notice what Paul says in Romans 5.11, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The atonement brings joy. When you're saved, you can truly know happiness. Because you know forgiveness through Christ. If you're lost, you can never truly be happy and never truly know what it is to have joy and rejoice until you come to Christ. Now, back to 1 Peter chapter 4. In verse uh, 13, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Hey, I'm going through some things. Jesus went through some things. He did it for me as he died for my sins to shed his blood to forgive me. Wow, you mean I have the privilege of suffering for him who loved me enough to die for me? Woo, okay. That was the mindset of the early Christians. And it says, uh, Of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, I think that's interesting how he says exceeding joy. Let's go to 1 Peter 1.8. 1 Peter 1.8. He's talking about the trial of your faith in verse 7. And then he says, Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. He calls it unspeakable joy. 
And back in 1 Peter 4, um, 13, he calls it exceeding joy. There is this great joy in salvation, in being saved and knowing you're saved. And this joy is the just the peace and the happiness of resting in Christ and knowing that you're safe. Um, 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, 1 Peter 4, 14, happy are ye. What? You mean I can be happy? You mean I can have happiness in suffering? You mean I can be happy? I can have joy and gladness? How, how, how can I be glad? How can I have this joy in suffering? Most people go, oh, I'm miserable. Oh, I'm going through this. Oh, I'm going through that. Why are they upset? Why are they miserable? Why is life so bad? Because they don't have Jesus to help them through it. If you're saved and you have Jesus to help you through it, you can get through anything with Jesus Christ. And you can actually be happy as you go through it, believe it or not. I've got here written down James 5.11, so let's go to James 5.11. James 5.11 says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, and the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So he's talking about what? He's talking about being patient and happy, enduring something. Well, that takes us over here to the tribulation. In the tribulation, there's seven years of the tribulation. It's divided into three and a half years and three and a half years. Forty-two months and forty-two months. You know how many chapters there are in the book of Job? Forty-two chapters. Job is a perfect type of a Jew in the last part of the tribulation who loses everything they have, but they're happy, and they're, they're happy as they can be, and they have joy because they get it all back as soon as it's over. Job got everything back. So there'll be a 42-month period in which the Jews are upset. So here's an illustration, once again, of how 1 Peter can apply to Jews in the tribulation. Go to 1 Peter 3.14. But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. So there is some happiness, there is some joy that you can find if you're saved in Christ when you're suffering something. Have you ever been in a time in your life when you were just so down and out and things were so bad and you thought it was the end of the world and you thought, oh, I have no hope whatsoever. And have you ever just found joy and peace and happiness in Christ? Well, the Bible says it's there and you can get it. You just need to look for it. So, back to uh, 1 Peter 4. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you, upon you, resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. God is glorified when we suffer reproach for his name's sake. Um, evil spoken of, it says there. It's talking about someone speaking evil of God when they speak evil of you. Uh, let's look at, well, you know what, I just don't have time. I'm going to skip this, but go to 2 Peter 3, 1 through 4. Read that when you get a chance. Then go to Jude 1, 8. In the last days, it says there'll be scoffers, people that go around. What's a scoffer? Someone making fun. And then in Jude 1, 8, it talks about mockers. In the last days, there will be people that are mocking and scoffing and laughing at and making fun of Christians. If you've ever felt that, and I have, I've been out preaching on the street before and I have people come up and lie and laugh at me and say, oh, there's no, that Bible's just a man's book, you're just a hypocrite, you're the dumbest person, ah, ha, ha, we all came from monkeys, you know, they believe in evolution, you're just an idiot, ah, and they just laugh and mock at you. And it doesn't hurt me, if anything, it makes me sad and feel sorry for those people. But deep down, I kind of go, well, amen, amen that they're, they're attacking me, because this is for the cause of Christ. Is there any greater cause than that? You can actually be happy if you're spoken evil of for the name of Christ. Now, verse 15, here we have three things. And these three things are important. Three things that a Christian should not suffer as. Verse 15 says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody, in men's matters. Okay, excuse me, there's four things there. <laughs> okay, 
What are the four things? Four things we should never do. We should not be a thief. We should not be a murderer. We should not be a... evildoer. We should not be a busybody. So there's four things here that the Bible says that we that are Christians should never be guilty of. Never be a thief. Don't steal from other people. That's not right. I don't want to be a thief. I don't want to steal. Don't be a murderer. I don't want to murder people. You know, there's more than just murdering people physically. You can assassinate their character by lying about them, slandering them, saying things that aren't true. That's awful. That's being an evildoer. We should never be an evildoer. And then we should never be a what? A busybody. What is a busybody? Well, the term is used twice more in the Bible. Let's look at those quickly. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. A busybody is someone who is busy, that's in the word, devoting their body to go around and get into other people's business. I mean, there's really no other way to define a busybody. That's what a busybody is. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10. And the Bible says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Oh, okay. Uh, I think they're called backbiters in 2 Thessalonians 3. Then it goes on and talks about them and who they are. Uh, verse 14 says, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. A busybody, a person who's a busybody, ought to be ashamed of themselves. Because they're devoting their time to go over and get in the business of somebody else so they can nitpick and attack and make fun of and mock and talk bad about others. So that's one passage that talks about busybodies. The other is 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy 5, 13. And the context is a woman. Okay, so over there sounds like a man. Over here sounds like a woman. 1 Timothy 5, 13. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. So a busybody is connected with someone who does wrong, but also speaks wrong. So they're out saying things that they shouldn't. They're evil doers because they're evil speakers. And a busybody is someone who's going around spreading gossip about people and talking bad about people and saying things they shouldn't about other people. Speaking things which they ought not. Verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Also, a person who speaks reproachfully is a busybody. For some have already turned aside after Satan. If you have become a busybody, and you devote your time to talking bad about other people, then you have turned aside to Satan, and you ought to be ashamed. A busybody ought to be ashamed. Because we've looked at this, this time, and the time before, and the time before that, and then go way back to when we first started chapter 2, that a Christian is not supposed to evil speak about other Christians. A Christian is supposed to have grace, charity, kindness, hospitality. They're supposed to be sober, they're supposed to love and edify, be long-suffering, apt to teach, and minister to others. Not going around as a busybody and just nitpicking and talking bad about other Christians. Yet there's a lot of people out there like that. If you get a chance, go to Ephesians 4.31. Let's do that. Let's go to Ephesians 4.31. So being a busybody is connected to how you speak. And if you're living your life just to talk bad about other Christians, then you're a busybody. And you've turned aside to Satan, and you ought to be ashamed. Okay? I could go farther with that. I could even mention some names, but I'm not going to, because I'd rather suffer when they talk bad about me. But Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Yet there are people out there that claim to be Christians, and a lot of them are on YouTube doing their little YouTube thing. Whatever, I mean, that's fine. Freedom of speech. Help yourself. Say whatever you want. 
But don't tell people you're a King James Bible believer when you're going against what the King James Bible says and you're being the very thing that the King James Bible says you're not supposed to be. And what's sad is you're not even ashamed of yourself. <laughs> That's sad. That's sad. 1 Peter 2.1 We've looked at before. Lay aside all malice and all guile and evil speakings, it says there. All right, so I could name names. You know, Paul did. You know, Paul said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. And he talked about people that always did him bad. But I've always said, I don't want to mention names. I don't want to talk about people that talk about me. I choose to suffer because I'm happy. I rejoice knowing that there's people attacking me. That shows me that I must be doing something right. You know, Paul says in, I believe it's in Thessalonians, where he says, we preach the gospel, but with much contention. You know, the more I preach the gospel, the more people attack me. Well, that shows me I must be doing right. Because when you do right, the Bible says, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So they want to persecute? Then do it. But you know what my goal is? Is to glorify God. So let's go back to verse um, 14 in 1 Peter 4. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of. All right? If you're speaking evil of Robert Breaker for doing what I do, trying to minister to you and teach the Bible, then you're not talking bad about me. You're talking about God that's in me, that's given me this ability to minister. That's what we read there in verse 11. I'm doing the best I can, and you're attacking me? All right, then God is being glorified through me, verse 11. And I want God to be glorified through me. You're attacking me? <laughs> well, then you're not glorifying God. But look what I can do. For the glory, uh, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. Who? God. They're speaking evil of me, they're speaking evil of God. But on your part, he is glorified. The more they attack and say evil things about me, the, the more that glorifies God. Because I will not cower down. I will not change my belief on the truth. All they're doing is exposing themselves for who they are. Not true King James Bible believers. I think it's so sad. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer. Well, they might say, well, I'm not a thief, I'm not a murderer, I'm not an evildoer. Or as a busybody. That's you. That's you, bud. You know who you are. That watches my videos because you can't wait to put out another video against me. And try to take my words and twist them and things like that. It's kind of sad. It's kind of sad. I want to glorify God. I'm not here to please man. I'm here to please God. And Paul said in Galatians 1.10, you know, uh, let's read that. Galatians 1.10, you know, if all I cared about was money and making people happy, then I would do everything I could to be non-offensive and, and try to say things a certain way so people would want to hear what I have to say. But I can't do that. I've just got to give what the Bible says. Some will like it, some won't. But I can sleep well at night knowing that I said what the Bible said. Galatians 1.10 for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I had pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul says, look, I'm not on this earth to please you. I might not do or say things that you like. But I'm doing everything I can to try to please God and give Him the glory through my ministry, through my teaching and preaching. And I'm not ashamed. Look at verse 16. 1 Peter 4, 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. So I don't talk about people that attack me and say, Oh, they're so really, 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 and, and complain about it and murmur. <laughs> I say, Glory to God. I'm not ashamed. They ought to be ashamed. But you know what? If I'm suffering, I'm going to suffer for Jesus. I want to suffer for doing right, not for doing wrong. All right, then we come to close to the end, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. What's he talking about? I think he's talking about the body of Christ, the church. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Well, the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And in Romans 10, it talks about believing the gospel and obeying the gospel. How do you obey the gospel? By faith. Through faith, you believe the gospel. What will be the end of those who don't believe the gospel? Well, the answer is simple. They go to hell. If you don't trust the gospel, then you go to hell. And the gospel is the gospel of salvation. It is how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again, according to the scriptures. It's the blood atonement, how he died. He shed his blood. If you don't accept this, if you don't obey it by believing it, then you go to hell. 
Now, I still get emails sometimes from people say, Oh, Breaker, you're so dumb, there's no such thing as hell. And I go, Oh, really? <laughs> then why does Psalms 917 say, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God? Yeah, why was, why was hell talked about in the Old Testament? Yeah, there's a hell, and you're wrong. Where is hell? Isaiah 14.9 says, Hell from beneath is moved for thee. There is a hell, and it's below the earth, and it burns. And that's the souls of those that are damned, they go there. What is hell? Well, Jesus called it hell fire in Matthew 5.22. In Mark 9, 43, 45, and 47, Jesus said this, unless you have a new version. This is why I'm King James only, because new versions take out words. And they take out these whole verses, Mark 9.43, 9.45, and 9.47. And in those verses, Jesus is speaking of hell as a fire that shall never be quenched. And in Mark 3.29, Jesus calls it eternal damnation. So this is what happens to those that obey not the gospel. Look at verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? The answer is in hell. The ungodly are those who are unsaved. All right? I hope you're watching this and I hope you're saved. If you're not, you're ungodly. And you're ungodly, then you're lost. The lost are the unsaved. Where do the unsaved go when they die? They go down to hell. But the good news is the gospel. That's what the word gospel means, good news. And then the good news is you don't have to go to hell. Jesus died in your place for your sins. Where shall the ungodly appear? In hell. Romans 4, 5, and 5, 6 talk about the ungodly. 2 Peter 3, 7, Jude 1, 15, all talking about the ungodly. The ungodly go to hell, but you don't have to. You can come to Christ, be saved by faith in his blood. Romans 3, 25. So, Let's finish up here, and let me read again verse 17 and 18, then we'll finish up with verse 19. 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. All right? The context is quit doing wrong and quit doing these things. All right? So if you're a thief, if you murdered someone, if you're an evildoer, if you're a busybody, and you claim to be a Christian, and you truly are saved, then cut it out. Stop it. Grow up. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. If it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? What happens to those that aren't saved? Well, they go to hell. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, the sinner goes to hell. My whole ministry, I've tried to give the gospel because I don't want to see people go to hell. What is hell? It's eternal suffering. And that's basically what this whole book is about. It's about Jesus' suffering for you to save you from hell. It's about you when you get saved, then as a Christian you're going to suffer in this life. And it's about if you don't get saved, then you're going to suffer forever in hell. The book of 1 Peter is a book of suffering. And if, if it ends up in verse 19, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. I think it's interesting that he ends this chapter by saying that Jesus Christ is the Creator. He's God, the Creator God. Romans 1.25, Paul talks about Jesus as the Creator. Ephesians 3.9, unless you have another version, it says that God created all things by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Creator. New versions take out by Jesus Christ. Why do they do that? In Isaiah 43.15, in Isaiah 40.28, the Lord of the Old Testament is called the Creator. Isaiah 43, 11 and 14, the Creator is also called the Savior and the Redeemer. Now, I had a whole much more I wanted to finish, but I'm tired. So I'm just going to throw these verses out, let you write them down and look it up. But I want to say that the same Lord of the Old Testament is the same Lord of the New Testament. Acts 10, 36, it says Jesus is Lord. And 1 Corinthians 12, 3 as well. The same Savior of the Old Testament, the Lord, is the same Savior of the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior. Philippians 3.20, 2 Timothy 1.10, and Titus 3.6. Jesus is our Redeemer. In the Old Testament, the Lord says He was the Redeemer. Well, Jesus Christ came to redeem us our sins. Romans 3.24, Ephesians 1.7, and Hebrews 9.12. Jesus is the Redeemer. That means Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord of the Old Testament. You see, there's people out there that say, oh, there's only one God, there's not three. I agree. Yeah, there's not three gods. 
there's one God. But that one God consists of three persons. That's called the Godhead. One and three. Three and one and one and three and the one in the middle died for me. That doesn't make three gods. That's still one God, but he's made up of three. Well, I'm made in his image. You know what I am? I'm a triune being in the sense that I'm made up of three, but I'm one. I'm a body, I'm a soul, I'm a spirit. So if I have three, God has three. But it's one God. Jesus Christ is God the Son. We see that in Hebrews when we did our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. And uh, he came as the Son of God, but yet he is God. Emmanuel, Matthew 1, 23. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. 1 Timothy 3, 16. God manifest in the flesh. Unless you have a new version, they change that. They mess with it. Acts 20, 28. It says, God purchased the church with his own blood. Unless you have a new version, they change that. <laughs> And 1 John 5.20, let's close with that. Jesus Christ is God. And if you ever hear someone say that he's not, and I still get emails from people who say, Jesus Christ isn't God. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. There's verse after verse after verse that proves that Jesus is God. And he died for us. He's the same Lord of the Old Testament as the New Testament. You mean Jesus was around in the Old Testament? Yep. He was called the angel of the Lord. He was called the captain of the Lord's host. And in uh, 1 John 5, 20, we read, And we know that the Son of God has come, who's that? Jesus, and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Who is the true God in eternal life? Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us. So Jesus is Lord, He's Savior, He's Redeemer, He's Creator, and He's God. So that'll do it. Thank you for watching. Next time we'll start in chapter 5. And I'm anxious to get there. And Well, I'm anxious to finish the book. But as I told you before, this book has been so much to me. It meant a lot to me because a lot of times in my life when I suffered as a Christian, these books were comforting because they said I could have joy and happiness and gladness and peace and rejoice in my suffering. And I found that when I got closer to Jesus. And those, although might have been some of the worst times of my life, because I really went through a lot, I look back and say they were actually some of the best times of my life, because that's the closest I've ever been to Jesus when I suffered. All right, thank you. We'll see you next time in Chapter 5.